under 20 minutes on sense of agency uh, and um, I'm going to try to first of all say what sense of agency is, how it can be studied scientifically because it's a subjective experience and then this is perhaps the interesting part for decision making, what's the relationship between sense of agency and value and between sense of agency and choice? So what is the sense of agency? Well, I don't know if Joe is still there, but here's a beautiful philosophical quote from Wittgenstein. What is left over if I subtract the fact that my arm goes up from the fact that I raise my arm? So Wittgenstein actually asked this question ironically because he thought it was a stupid question. And I think it's actually quite a good question. And one potential answer uh, to this question is that a sense of agency is different if you compare my arm going up from the fact that I raise my arm because the sense of agency can be defined as the feeling that one controls one's own actions and through them events in the outside world. So for example, if I'm voting in a meeting and I raise my arm, then I can change the course of the, uh, uh, well, of the society in which I'm uh, operating. So we have this experience of making actions and causing outcomes, which is the sense of agency. And we can think about that as a very simple sort of linear deployment between our decisions, our actions, in this case, raising my arm, and a set, a set of, well, there are lots of words, effect, outcome, goal, consequence, lots of them. Uh, they all basically mean the same thing. And they relate to, to a concept in, psychology called intentional action. So the, the things that happen, happen because I intended them to happen. And agency is effectively the, the way that I use my actions to achieve my goals. And uh, th this is um, uh, of interest because it's of big civilizational importance. If you uh, plant crops, you need to realize the link between the action of planting and the action of harvesting, which happens several months later. If you develop technology, you need to realize the link between the, uh, um, the action that you make with a tool and the outcome that the tool produces. And in uh, political action, a beautiful quote by Karl Marx, uh, it's only if you can link what you do to what happens that you can achieve change. So um, in conventional decision making, you get lots of studies like this, where you have a couple of objects and they correspond, their values correspond to decision bounds and you attempt to work out which one you want. And it seems to me that a lot of the uh, value-based decision making literature is really about how we perceive objects. So we have these objects and we uh, compute their perceived value and somehow that perceptual computation drives everything else. You don't read much about the decision itself, about the action of eating, any of these rather horrible looking donuts. I think there's a green pepper, but these are donuts. And you certainly don't read about the outcome. So the outcomes of eating a green pepper and the outcomes of eating a donut are not identical and it matters. So the research challenge then um, is how can we capture the distinctive feeling that I made something happen through my decision and how to um, avoid in, in studying this idea of making things happen and the feeling of making things happen, how to avoid the known biases of self-efficacy so uh, people tend to think that everything that they did is brilliant, um, which is obviously a bias in sense of agency and desirability. So if you ask me, um, how do you feel about the fact that you made her cry or you made him cry, uh, then obviously I'm gonna have a big social desirability bias in the way that I respond to that question. And I might say, well, it wasn't me. I might deny agency. So the answer in my view is to try to measure agency in, in simple instrumental cases where you have a simple action that leads to a simple outcome, which are not very value laden, and to try to use implicit measures where people can't effectively um, uh, be swayed by these sort of evaluative biases. So um, I'm going to tell you very briefly about ways that we've studied sense of agency using time perception or mental chronometry. So we take a very, very uh, simple action like uh, pressing a button. And when you press the button, this causes an outcome. And this outcome is a beep and it happens a few hundred milliseconds after you've pressed the button. So we can say that your goal is to produce this uh, uh, beep. And while this is happening, you're watching a clock going 
going round on the computer screen. It's just got one hand and it goes round at roughly this kind of speed. And you can use this clock to do mental chronometry to say when you think you had the experience of pressing the button and when you think you had the experience of hearing the beep. And the idea is that the way that we perceive when things happen tell us quite a lot about how the brain links uh, the representations of what we do to the representation of what we make happen as a result of our actions. So in this particular trial, the person might say, well, I think I pressed the button when the clock was at 23. In fact, we know they pressed the button when the clock was at 25. And that bias or that error in their time perception can tell us something, and I'll show you what. So we're going to start with a block of trials where you just watch this clock. You don't do anything, but you do hear a beep, which the computer makes at a random time. And we ask you, when do you think you hear the beep? And people often say they hear the beep a little bit before it actually happened. And then we compare that to a second block of trials where you press the button and you produce the beep. So now you've got agency. So it's kind of your beep. It's the uh, outcome of your action. And we can ask exactly the same question. When do you think you heard the beep? And what we find is there's a shift in the awareness of the beep in the block of trials where you made the beep happen compared to the block of trials where the beep just happened all by itself. And we can do exactly the same now on the um, action side, because we can have a block of trials where you press a button and nothing happens, and we can ask you, when do you think you press the button? And we compare this to a block of trials where you press the button and you change the world by making this beep happen, and we find there's a shift in the perceived time of the action towards the subsequent change in the external environment. So if you put those two things together, which I think is coming in the next slide. Um, what you, in, in these experiments, the action and the beep are separated by 250 milliseconds in reality. But by comparing the shifts in the perceived time of action, the shifts in the perceived time of the beep, um, in the conditions where those two events co-occur, we can see that there's a, a bias of 15 milliseconds forwards in the time of action, 46 milliseconds backwards in the Time, perceived time of the beep. So in reality, people per, uh, in, in perception, people perceive their action and the beep that it causes as being closer together than they really are. We don't measure this perceived interval directly, but we can infer it by the shifts in the perceived time of each event. So there's some kind of binding going on where two things are linked together because my action made the outcome happen. And we need a control condition to show this is really related to my intention or my decision or my volition or to, to something that I did. And the control condition comes from um, magnetic brain stimulation. So here's a, a coil held over my left motor cortex. I was much younger at the time, as you can see. And when uh, Stefan um, presses a button on the computer, then this makes a magnetic field pass into the brain and it causes involuntary movements of the uh, right hand, which are actually mu movements of the same muscles that I would use to voluntarily press the button in the uh, experiment I just showed you. So we can compare the binding of action and beep involuntary action to what happens in these involuntary transcranial magnetic stimulation induced muscle twitches. And when the movement is involuntary in this involuntary condition, you don't get binding. It's almost like the brain is actually trying to keep the twitch of the muscle and the beep that follows away from each other because they're unrelated, as if the brain is sort of saying, you know, don't be fooled by this guy behind you with the big magnet. It's not you who's making that beep happen. He's making you move and then it's followed by a beep. So we use the phrase intentional binding to refer to the, the, the subjective linkage across time between I press the button and I heard the beep. And it's part of this experience of that outcome is the product of my decision. I made that happen. Okay, so um, here's a block of trials where um, the probability of the tone given the action is 50%. So sometimes you press the button and you get the tone. Sometimes you press the button and you don't get any tone. It's completely random. And what you find is that you get a binding of the action towards the beep on the 50% of trials where the tone happens, but rather less, only five milliseconds, if the tone is emitted. So if you compare these two, it looks as though there's something about the tone happening 
which changes the way you perceive the action that you made and which either caused the tone or didn't. So this is obviously a retrospective reconstruction. It fits well with what uh, Joe was saying in the first talk about the way that we look back on what we did and we try to explain it. Um, and uh, we reconstruct our sense of agency, but we don't just reconstruct it, it's also predictive. We also have a model of our own agency. So here's a block of trials where the probability of the tone given the action is much higher, it's 75%. So now, if you look at the binding of the action, perceived time of the action towards the tone, it actually occurs both in the trials where the action does cause the tone and in the randomly intermixed trials where the action should cause the tone, but it's randomly emitted. So you get binding in both cases. And if you compare these two numbers, it's a good idea of the way that the model that you have of your own agency, your prediction about what the outcome of your action will be, gives you part of your experience of making that happen. This is quite good. It, it suggests that we're not constantly surprised by what our actions do, but we can actually form a model of, you know, I predict if I if I press the button, then the light will go on or the light will go off or I'll uh, get rich or whatever it is. Now, how does this relate to the wider landscape of why people decide? So here's a rather nice experiment on value done by Michiko Yoshie. So you press the button and in the baseline condition, you just hear a sound 250 milliseconds later. But she compared that to three conditions where the sound is not a beep, but is actually something intrinsically um, value laden. So the sound is now um, a human vocalization of joy or happiness. So this is something like, ah, um, um, here is the neutral condition. And here uh, you press the button and you produce a sound, which is a very brief recording of something like, ah, a scream of fear or disgust. And what you can see is there's a um, the black is the shift in the perceived time of the action towards the sound. The gray is the shift in the perceived time of the sound back towards the action. And there's more binding for nice outcomes, nice noises that happen when you press the button than for horrid noises which happen when you press the button. So we're not actually asking people, is it nice or is it nasty? All we're asking is, when does it happen? When does the action happen? When does the outcome happen? And the time at which you perceive things seems to reflect or capture this way that we normally link our actions to nice outcomes more than nasty outcomes. Value affects the basic primary perception of our own agency. Now choice, I've chosen a rather sort of dramatic um, uh, example to illustrate choice. So in the Milgram experiment, um, people were told to administer what they thought was an electric shock to another person. In fact, it was all a deception and it's not a very good experiment. Um, but it's interesting because the idea is that when you tell the person, you must do this, uh, there are lots of big uh, sort of psychological traumas related to obedience and responsibility. And um, Milgram basically focused on whether people would obey these orders or not. But what we want to focus on in this experiment is what's the sense of agency when you do something bad? What's the sense of agency when you give somebody a shock? And um, does it make a difference when you have a choice, when you do something out of free choice, when you choose to give somebody a shock versus when you're made or told or coerced to give somebody a shock? And this is relevant to you know why people do, might be relevant to why people do bad things. So we made a number of methodological improvements to the basic Milgram experiments, which have a lot of um, ethical and methodological problems. And we developed an experiment uh, where the experimenter who is here um, gives a coercive instruction to an, a participant who we call the agent to give an electric shock to another participant who we call the quote victim unquote. Um, the, notice that victim is in quotes because uh, this person's not a victim. They participate on the basis of informed consent under Helsinki arrangements. They can stop at any time. And um, they are receiving a painful electric shock. And it's obviously painful because at the start of the experiment, uh, these two people um, deliver electric shocks to each other to calibrate a moderate but definitely painful level, which causes them to flinch. So it's 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 not pleasant, um, and it, but it's not deceptive either. So this person 
gives the instruction to the agent to give the shock to the quote victim, and the agent knows that they are indeed giving a shock to the quote victim. And it's also, unlike Milgram, it's reciprocal because these people then change roles, and after this person has given shocks to this person, they swap, and this person can shock the other one back, and actually they do retaliate a bit. Um, so it's, it, it may not be very nice, but it is fair. And we're going to make implicit measures of sense of agency under two conditions. In one condition of coercive instruction, where the, per the participant is told that they must give a shock, and in another condition where the experimenter sits in the room but doesn't play any active part and says, um, you may give a shock to her if you want. And most people, of course, don't choose to do that. Um, so there's a mild uh, financial incentive. You get a little bit of money if you deliver a shock to the other person. And of course, you might want to do it because you're retaliating for when she shocked you. So um, in each trial, there's an action, there's a delay, it's followed by a tone, and we happen to be recording the brain activity in response to this tone. And the way that we're measuring bindings now a little bit different. We're actually uh, slightly varying this interval from trial to trial, and we ask people just to report in milliseconds how long they think it, that this interval is. So they'll say something like 350 or 450 or whatever. Um, and um, here we have... Uh, a condition where you're coerced, where you're coerced into choosing one button or the other, and here's a condition where you freely choose which button to press, and uh, depending on which button to press, the person will either get no shock or they'll get a painful shock as well as the tone. So it's a two by two design. So here's the actual interval between the action and the tone, and here's what the um, agent says they think the interval is. And you can see that in free choice trials in black, where you choose whether to give a shock or not, the agent always estimates the interval as being less than in the coercive condition where they're told which button to press and they're told that they have to give a shock or not. So this interval here is basically a reduction in the perceived delay between action and outcome, and uh, it's a re measure of reduced sense of agency. So our, our judgment, our, our conclusion here is that coercion reduces the sense of agency, and that's shown by this little uh, area here. I won't have time to talk about the effects on the on the brain. Um, now, this is quite interesting because, of course, when people are coerced, they say they don't feel responsible, but this is a low-level primary perceptual measure, which suggests that actually they don't feel as much agency over what happens when they're coerced as when they freely choose. So just to conclude, the sense of agency refers to the experience of linkage between one's actions and their consequences. This experience is fun fundamental for functional autonomous choice, and I think it's the basis of modern society. And I want to ask a question, why is the obvious fact that decisions have consequences largely absent from the current literature on biological decision making. Well, I've managed to talk for so long that there isn't time for anybody to answer this question, but perhaps you can um, put your answers um, uh, in the chat. And I'm going to hope that if I now go back to hop in that you're all still there because I haven't seen you. Um, and at that point, um, I'm going to finish chairing my own talk. Uh, if there's time for one or two questions, perhaps we can take them um, or maybe uh, uh, maybe nobody was there at all. So I'm looking at the Q&A, uh, and uh, Mady's asking, is there a bias perception of uh, the time between action and outcome for very short intervals? And um, right, great question. If the interval's really, really short, people don't perceive any delay at all because of temporal integration. Um, and uh, uh, as the interval gets longer, then the uh, binding gets less. So very long delays, it's difficult to associate the action and the outcome. If you look at you know, a politician trying to control the inflation rate, there's a long delay, and I think they don't feel a big sense of agency. So basically, as David Hume said, temporal contiguity is important for agency. Um, uh, you know, it's easier to detect causal relations when cause and effect happen closely together in time. But the bias is there over a kind of a range of intervals, which I would call sensory motor time. So that's about um, 200 to 1,000 milliseconds. <laughs>